I'm Robin Crane, and this is the Growing Your Financial Business, The Woman's Way podcast. Listen, I was a financial advisor for over a decade, and I got so sick of the old archaic strategies that your grandpa used to get clients. What the industry teaches today is still so outdated and just doesn't work anymore. So I had to find a better way for myself, and then I got obsessed with sharing these how-tos with other women like me. The stuff I teach doesn't require giving up your life, your sanity, or your family time. I want women like you to have it easier than I had it so you can thrive in the industry. I've now helped thousands of women grow their financial businesses to multiple six figures, some even seven figures per year. So on this podcast, you're going to get an inside look at how they did it so you can do it too. Let's dive into the show. Welcome, welcome. I am here with Penny. So Penny Phillips, she has spent most of her career coaching and consulting financial advisors, business owners, and wealth management institutions. She is the co-founder and president of Journey Strategic Wealth, a registered investment advisor built for advisors seeking independence and full-fledged practice management support. So I'm super excited about this because I have a lot of questions, Um, but tell us a little bit more about your background and how you got into starting an RIA Um, And then we'll jump into how some of the women listening might want to go independent, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not a year from now, but maybe someday. And I know I have clients who are at big firms and oftentimes they don't think about it, but then there is a part of them that's like, well, if I could do that and I could do it well, and it could give me a better lifestyle, maybe I would. So I'd like, you know, pay attention to this. So you have that option in the future. Tell us a little more about you and, and how you decided to build this company. Absolutely. First of all, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I always love talking about the business and the industry, especially to female advisors. Um, So I, as you said, spent my career coaching and consulting advisors and uh, I made a couple stops at uh, firms, consulting in-house firms like Investnet, uh, may have heard of that firm, Uh, launched a consulting company and spent years consulting teams and advisors on transitioning to independence. Do I want to build lifestyle or enterprise? How do I do that? How do I build a cohesive team? How do I monetize? And what I started to notice, Robin, was the the challenges advisors were coming to us to changed rapidly, I'd say, over the last five to seven years. So it, it went from, I want to build efficiently within the structure that I'm in, whether it's a broker dealer or captive firm, to gosh, I'm hearing so much about all these deals happening and advisors getting offered money and monetizing and and should I be thinking about leaving and going independent? And so the consulting work started to shift on helping advisors really build something independently outside of, of the system and really weigh deals and figure out what was right for them. Um, I was running a workshop program called Practice to Enterprise at the time where we took independent advisor business owner, solopreneurs, I call them, put them together and and work on business building ideas and the pandemic hit. And so it forced me to think about, gosh, the workshop business, uh, I don't know how that's going to look over the next couple of years. And maybe now is the opportunity to do something different and help advisors in a much deeper way and actually build the firm that I've been consulting them to look for. And so I had been talking about this um, with a couple of um, my now partners for years. Uh, and we really wanted to build something that took all of what's great about the insurance BDs, the independent BDs, the wirehouses and the RIA space and bring them all together. And so we did that and we're having a fabulous time. That's awesome. I kind of feel like you you have my dream and you started to live it before um, I could. There's plenty of abundance and, and opportunities like that. But I've been thinking about things like that, too, because so so many of the women that I help grow their business, um, some of them are at you know captive agents, like you said, or some of them are at big, big companies. And it's like it's harder because I I teach things that are so outside the box, you know, like ways to attract clients, uh, ways to market themselves. And I'm all about like you building your brand around like being authentic and real. I mean, very much like we we call it the woman's way, you know, and, and then some of these companies don't even let them have a voice. And I'm so passionate about like giving them a voice and not, it's not my voice, it's their voice, but like having them express themselves in a way that they feel like is very aligned with their values and who they are. And it's not always available to them because I mean, I have so many clients who they're not even allowed to write a book. And I I mean, I usually track the ones that are because we we use a strategy around that, but it's like, how can they not be able to write a book? You know, it sucks. So, so I love this. I love this push. Um, So 
I'm kind of curious, like, how, so let's say someone wants, wants to go that route, but maybe they have kind of a cushy situation. And I don't know how cushy anything is right now with, with the way that the market is these days, but, um, or maybe it's, it's more like they don't because they're thinking, oh, well, I could have moved, but now with all the volatility and stuff, it might not be a good time. So what are the things they need to consider with like getting that in place? So one day they can go independent or even considering, should they go independent? Such a great question. And I would say you're right on. What's happened is the industry, and when I say industry, I usually mean the big firms, the big IBD firms, the big wirehouses, haven't evolved as fast as the consumer's needs have evolved, right? So the way the consumer interacts with a service provider has changed in every industry. We're using social media, we're digital, we're texting, et cetera. Financial services industry, now they're telling advisors, go on LinkedIn and cold DM people. Like they're seven years in the past. Anyway, so I think you're right. Advisors have yeah, um, yeah, just with horrible messaging. Mind exactly. You, right? they, don't, they don't know anything about messaging, but just call DM people and, <laughs> right. and you'll get all these clients all of a sudden because shoot, pandemic hit, so we've got to do something, but we don't know what. Yeah. It's okay. wild. Yeah. Okay. And so... Yeah. And, and so you're right, advisors have sort of woken up. Um, and the, the thing, one thing you said just resonated with me about, you know, I, I know there's a lot of advisors and even consultants who've thought, I've always wanted to do that, but it's not the right time. It's too difficult. I will tell you firsthand experience. Yes, it is difficult. It is not impossible. And there is never a right, perfect time. Valuations are still very high right now. I think they'll come down a little bit, but there's never a time where it doesn't make sense to go independent or launch an advisory business. So I, I will say that firsthand experience. The thing I tell advisors, and I, I, I don't want to play the, the female angle too much, but it is true that I talk to so many female advisors who simply don't know what they don't know. And, and sometimes I'll talk to them and it's like, some of the, the the male advisors and we see them you know all day every day in our industry publications like who bought this firm and what valuation it's like they're part of some secret club where everybody knows exactly how to do it who to go to for capital and 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 i, I just feel like more education around how to think about independence is key so what i tell advisors is you think about independence on a spectrum and from the advisor's standpoint the way to think about that is it's lowest cost versus, versus highest value for you if you're going independent. And so an advisor may be at a Northwestern Mutual or a Guardian Life or a UBS or wherever. And the options for them in going independent are lowest cost, meaning, and I'm doing a lot with my hands. I don't even know if people can see me on video, Robin. Okay, it's just audio. Oh, so I'm light, but most are going to probably be listening. I'm Greek. So it's like, and a New Yorker. Oh, so going. yeah, <laughs> it's okay. sideways pointing. So lowest cost or highest value. So you're thinking to go independent. Lowest cost means you're getting the highest payout. And the one misconception, biggest misconception is I'm going to leave. I'm going to go to an LPL or whomever. I'm going to get a 92% payout. Gosh, freedom, independence, low cost to me. The reality is, and this often happens when people make that initial independent jump to a broker dealer is, first of all, you're still at a broker dealer. So if you're leaving a captive environment, you're going to an independent firm, you're still dealing with FINRA, you're still dealing with compliance. Things will be better, but you're still dealing with a broker dealer structure where it's to some extent, eat what you kill, okay? The other thing is you're getting a 92% payout, which perhaps is better than what you're getting where you're at, but you are now responsible for fully running a P&L. And I will tell you as a consultant and coach, the challengers were always around managing margins in the business and managing a team. There are very few people, very few really skilled financial planners and, and technical advisors who also enjoy being a CEO and business owner. Very few. The industry has pushed this narrative to advisors, like to be successful, you have to transition from advisor to CEO. And I mean, me too, I was running a practice to enterprise course. But the reality is, is I think that notion has completely changed, especially during the pandemic. There's nothing wrong with doubling down on being an advisor. There's nothing wrong with building lifestyle practice. There are structures that can help you continue to do that. So. Lowest cost, you're getting that 92% payout, but you now you're running your whole business. You're responsible for everything operationally, scaling, tech, et cetera. The other side of the equation is what I call 
uh, highest value. Highest value meaning you are either taking a buyout immediately. So firms like Mercer, Focus, the big RIAs want to immediately buy your business. And then you become an employee of the RIA with your team. Now, the draw for some advisors is, wow, great valuation on my business. I'll take the buyout. I can, can the, the, the firm will paint a picture of you can continue to do whatever you want. You're operating independently. You're advising. We've just paid you out. The downside to that structure is the obvious things. Sometimes it starts to feel like you're right back at the wirehouse or right back in a big corporate firm. The narrative that we've been pushing wrongfully on this side is that advisors need to sell their business. I want advisors to keep in mind that when you're getting pitched by a recruiter or by somebody that's offering to buy out your business, you are talking to their best salesperson. That best salesperson's job is to buy your business because the private equity firm that backs them needs them to buy your business. Advisors shouldn't sell or transact if A, they don't want to, B, it's not the right time, C, it doesn't make any sense for them in anything other than the firm pitching them on this being a good idea. So what we've tried to build is something in the middle. And I'll say the middle is usually an RIA firm giving you a payout between 75 and 85% in exchange for tech and compliance and oversight. Now, that's the summits of the world, the dynasties to some extent. What I tell advisors is, you still have to run your own practice. Sometimes the cost of what you're getting, you can actually get cheaper on your own. So it doesn't always make sense to do that. So let me stop there before I give the journey story. So that's the, that, that's the option of spectrum. And w- what I tell advisors is you got to ask yourself a couple of key questions. Number one, do I need to de-risk? In other words, do I need money right now? Do I need a firm that can provide capital? Number two, what are the things I want to make sure I am always doing until the day I retire? What are the things I never want to do again? Those are the three most critical questions an advisor can ask. And I will tell you, when you're looking at RAs and independent firms, anyone who's pitching you on technology or investment management is lying to you. We all have the same tech. We all have the same investments. The differentiator is you, and it will always be you. And the differentiator of the firm is how much value they provide for the payout you're receiving. Nice. So going back a step. So when you say like a buyout, so I know there's a lot of incentives and um, like, I know one of my clients, she went from uh, Raymond James to LPL. And so she got an incentive, right. And, but they didn't buy out her clients. Is that something totally different? Totally different. And I just actually posted this on LinkedIn. It's a forgivable note. And what we see is there's a lot of hopping around in the industry, wirehouse to wire, indie to indie, because firms are saying, I mean, LPL is a ton of money to, to spread around. Like we will pay you to join us. Usually it's, it's either, for, um, it's a loan. Usually it's a forgivable note. It's paid back over time. The, the down it out of the, out of the revenue, basically you have to hit certain production hurdles and you're usually locked into the firm for anywhere from five to nine years. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So, and then what you're saying is like on the independent channel, they will actually, or or some of these bigger companies will basically buy the business and you essentially become an employee again. Like you don't own your clients, obviously you can't walk, but like you're taking care of your clients, but as an employee and you don't have much control anymore. And then when you're bringing in new clients, is it more like, is it still based on revenue or is it based on more of a salary plus commission or how does that work? Yep. You're getting paid a salary plus bonus. I would say that's an extreme example. Like um, the the majority of what advisors are facing with the optionality is they're usually in a place where they don't want to sell hundred percent. Right. So that may, that's not the right structure for them, but they're talking to firms, RIA firms that are saying, we'll buy 20% of your business and you now have a succession plan. You have continuity and we'll put you on a payout until then. Mm-hmm. And so there are a lot of different options out there for firms offering that. There's also options where firms are saying, we won't buy anything yet. We can buy you out, solves the succession problem. But until then, you can access our resources and our tech and our services and continue to run your thing. Um, the challenge for that, and this is another really important question when you're going full independent, is 
you're responsible for your own ADV contracting, usually compliance and oversight. And so there's risk that the advisor is holding when they maintain their own business tucked into a larger infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah. And when I, so I was a financial advisor at, um, First, I was at Woodbury, which is independent with air quotes, right? Because yeah. What you're talking about is not really independent. Yeah, old school. Um, and, and then I went to Cambridge Investment Research. Um, and again, independent, IBD, like you said. They're an IBD. Um, yeah. And and that was like, I was thinking, do I want to go independent? And even for me, independent, I guess that was like, I was thinking about having my own RAA when I made that switch. And I was like, no, I do not. Because I, I didn't want that risk like the compliance like i I, i'm not good at those details regardless and like the thought of having to deal with compliance or hire people like i was like no i don't want to do that so that that was one of the reasons i went as like an iar under the umbrella of cambridge um so tell us then how what you were going to say about the journey is that like how how is your company different and what are you doing differently that's that's that brings it to the two together yeah we so we wanted to maximize flexibility, structure, and support for advisors. Because what I found is that every advisor experience is different. Every advisor is different in terms of how they think, what they want for themselves. And so to bucket advisors in and say, okay, this is the option for you. We buy 40%, you stay with us for X number of years, or you tuck in and like, we needed to really be able to customize the offering. The other thing that was really important to me was giving advisors time and capacity back. The biggest hindrance to growth for an independent advisor is simply running out of capacity. Um, Advisor is usually the primary rainmaker and they run out of time to rainmake and bring in more business. And they get so caught up in trying to find another rainmaker to join them that they sort of forget that the most valuable thing they could do is create capacity for themselves. So our mission when we launched was to enable advisors to spend 80% or more of their time every week working with clients, business developing, engaging in whatever activities are fulfilling to them. I'm not going to dictate to an advisor that you should be prospecting every week, but if your vision is to, you know, 2X the business, then sure, we'll help you sort of think about how to fill that time that you're gaining back in a week. So our firm is a, uh, offers full operational support plus full-fledged practice management consulting. It's an ode to my prior life coaching advisors and, and the infrastructure that I felt would help advisors really build quickly and in a way they wanted. So advisory team joins us. We do a lot of due diligence beforehand, getting to know the advisor, understanding the dynamics of the business and the team, et cetera. Advisor joins us and we take over all expenses of the business, the entire P&L. We pay the salaries and bonuses of team members. We pay rent, we pay marketing, we pay everything affiliated with the business. And I tell advisors, you almost think of it as if having, you have a C-suite executive team behind the scenes, helping you think and make strategic decisions about the business. Um, In exchange for that, our advisors get what I call, and this is a very unique structure. We may be the only ones doing it this way. We pay advisors between 50 to 60%. Now, advisors tend to say 50%. Oh my God, I'm getting 87 right now. Why would I ever do that? What I tell advisors is look at the net profits of the practice you're running. If you're netting 40% after running the business, who cares what the top line payout is? What we're saying is we're going to pay you 55% and you don't have another expense. That is net to you. Any additional expenses over time, adding talent, increasing marketing initiatives. That's Journey's responsibility to manage our margins. So we take over P&L management of the firm. We begin a practice management engagement. We meet quarterly to do strategic business planning. We meet monthly to do business development and marketing planning. The, the, the reason we've structured it that way is because we don't want to take control away from the advisor, but we want to provide them with the strategic thinking support to be able to come up with their best ideas and then prioritize them. We handle everything operationally, um, trading, billing, investment management, performance reporting, tech, um, onboarding clients, compliance. Ev- every compliance, HR, mm-hmm. everything is handled by us. We will even step in and negotiate real estate contracts if you're moving to a bigger office. What's beautiful about the structure, I'm biased, of course, is that we're able to anticipate advisor needs. Normally, when an advisor is at a firm, 
even a big IBD firm that has great practice management resources, Cambridge, Commonwealth, they all have good practice management divisions. The problem is those teams are reactive, right? An advisor will call and say, oh my God, I need a job description or I'm, I'm hitting capacity. For us, because we're doing this ongoing engagement with the advisor where every quarter we're saying to them, here's the revenue brought in, here's the new households, here are the margins on each of the households, here's what you should be thinking about. We're able to anticipate the needs of the advisor. Oh, and by the way, we hire for the advisor. Um, The advisor has significantly more time in their week to bring in higher margin clients. So the firms are growing faster, the advisor's taking home more money, and they have a true partner helping them build. Now, the one caveat is, and this is another mindset shift that advisors have to make, everybody is a W-2 employee of Journey. Now, there's a big difference between the tax classification and being treated like an employee. Advisors aren't treated like an employee. They run their practice at their office, whatever location they're at, manage their team, et cetera. But from a tax standpoint and from a valuation standpoint, even more important, the businesses are worth more when everyone's a W-2 employee. So by getting tucked under journey, all of us under one ADV, everybody a W-2, the advisor gets to tag along if we monetize. So our valuation as a $3 billion RIA is significantly higher than an advisor's valuation as a $50 million IAR. So we're at 10X, guess what? Advisor gets the benefit of that valuation as well. Just real quick. So if I'm, I'm an advisor, I come over and I'm sure I'm curious about the criteria for how you choose because it sounds like that's very high end. But um, let's say I'm an advisor and I come over and now I'm W-2 and I get all that like because if anyone knows business expenses and, and, and high business expenses, it's me. Um, but, but so, so they come over and now they're W2, but there's, you said it's 55% ish, right? So that's still their W2 is based off of their revenue. Is that w- how that works or that's just a bonus? Their payout. So they, the, a million dollar team comes to us, uh, advisors producing a, a million dollars in revenue. The advisor is getting 550,000 net to them. W-2? Correct. Wow. Okay. And so then they're getting 550,000 W-2. And then as they grow, it's just, there's kind of like a snapshot and every, that you keep taking a snapshot and that, or is it every year and then they get a, an increase or what happens if like the market tanks and now they had a hundred million under management and now it's 80 million. Then what happens? Like they, now they're still getting the 550,000 for a year or something or how is that evaluated? It's reflective of the whatever the payout, let's say it's 55%. And we have a couple of hurdles because our max payout is 65%. And those are obviously the bigger business that businesses that are really operationally efficient. But if the advisor's um, payout is 55%, th- that's the reflective of the net profit. So yes, it is dependent on, you know, the revenue that they produce. Um, market's obviously not, not in a, a great position right now, but um, it's, it's not too dissimilar from, a structure where they're getting 90 percent it's just and kind of like how i don't know what you call it but basically w2 versus an s corp or something like that you're saying like every whatever it like quarter or whatever is based it's like a payout it's just w2 versus it being going through the s corp or something like that correct employment okay interesting interesting because so it's not like salary plus bonuses like the those companies are doing it's truly a payout it's just that it's in the form of a W-2, got it. Correct, and we pay FICA and all, all the- Right, and so as we grow, our- they're, making, they're, still making a, every, they're still making their 55%, assuming it's 55%. Okay, got it. And theoretically, okay. they're growing faster, revenue is going up, they're not getting hit with additional expenses. So in other words, f- firm grows when they join us. Uh, an advisor, it, we're talking to the advisor on an ongoing basis, we're saying, you know, maybe time to add an associate advisor. We're having that conversation we bring candidates, advisor interviews them, they find the person they like, great, we help onboard them. That expense doesn't come out of their payout. Yeah, I get it, I get it. That's our so, expense. But how, do the, how are those decisions, you, those decisions are basically made because you're having these monthly meetings and you're just, because I'm, let's say I'm this, this advisor and I'm like, well, I need an assistant or I need another advisor. And, and you guys are like, well, it ain't in the budget right now, baby. Like, it's still <laughs> kind of like that. Like, like, um, 
you know, that's such a good question. You really are making the decision, right? I can't say no. I demand, I need another advisor right now. And you're like, well, too bad, baby. Like, again, I call, I call you baby. I'm calling me baby. (laughs) You don't get it. Like, it's still up to you, up to the owners, up to the team. And I'm just like a W2 employee, even though it's based on my payout. Like there's, there's gotta be some line, right? Where I don't get to make, it sounds like I don't get to make those decisions. Well, you know, it's a, It's a really delicate balance. And this is a very bespoke sort of model where we're really asking advisors. And I will tell you, many of the people that we've attracted are advisors who I've coached in the past. Um, My business partner was also a a former consultant. And so they know A, our style of consulting and B, the way we think about practice management. What I want to avoid, so there's a delicate balance between us making, let's say, the final call and advisor having a say. Um, We will never say no to an advisor expense unless we feel that the expense is would be detrimental to to the business for any reason. So I would give the same advice to a team I was coaching as I would at Journey. So in other words, when I was coaching teams, we know as practice management experts, there are certain revenue points, there are certain margin points, there are certain number of household points where it makes sense to add talent, we know the sequence in which that talent might be added. So if an advisor says to me, I really need an executive assistant now, the conversation might be, let's talk about what key performance indicators have 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 indicated to you that you need an assistant. What are you feeling? What usually ends up happening is we recognize that it's not the operational non-revenue producing person that's needed. It's actually the associate advisor, uh, the person who can handle review meetings. So my job would be to help, if necessary, the advisor rethink the need and make sure that it fits in with the long-term plan for the business. Yeah. And it goes back to what you said at the beginning, which is like really understanding what do you want to do? What do you not want to do? Like what's most important to you? What is the lifestyle? Which is really key which is what advisors should be asking their clients, which doesn't always happen with the fact finding situation, but that's true. But, but really understanding their needs. And it sounds like you guys are very diligent about making sure it's the right fit. So that anyone who comes in understands like this, it's we're it's kind of like your business partners. Like we're business partners. Like you've got to exactly just because you have a business partner doesn't mean, you know, there, there's going to be somewhere where you got to give, you got to take, you got to, you know, you got to figure out like a pull because there's got to be some compromise. And so, yes, I hear you. I understand what you need. Let's see if we can solve that problem without adding someone to the payroll first. You know, maybe there's a way that we already have the resources. Like you're just going to problem solve. So let me understand the real problem. Let's see if this can fix it. If not, let's try this. And here are some other ways we can do it. How about this? Like, it sounds like it's just like, it's more like a partnership. Um, than anything else. It, that's spot on. And we do something else that's unique. We um, customize key performance indicators and metrics to the team. So we had a team join, we have two uh, wonderful advisors who I can't talk about yet joining us who really love the idea of this, this lifestyle practice, you know, working with a very specific set of female clients, uh, running virtual seminars, creating these communities within their practice for them, hitting certain AUM numbers every year is not important, right? Hitting certain, uh, adding a certain number of households is not necessarily important. What's important to them is client satisfaction, client retention. So those are the metrics we track for success for them. Right. We yep. survey their clients, check retention numbers. Um, per, I ask everybody to assess their own personal fulfillment. I mean, these are things that, you know, I, I'm thinking about a, a firm, a RIA, I know that spun out of a wirehouse. Like the guys at that firm would completely roll their eyes uh, if I said we're tracking personal fulfillment and happiness as a metric and we're not tracking AUM and revenue this year. But what I think what I think this has done for us is given us access to advisors who get it and who are thinking differently about what it means to be independent and what they really want. Mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah, that's awesome. And then last, last kind of part, I think maybe is what is the criteria? So it sounds pretty high end. Like, is it a hundred million? Like what what, do you have a kind of, you know, we Candidly, Robin, we've gone back and forth on, originally I didn't want to set minimums and I wanted to build a firm that was really catering to advisors coming out of the the Northwestern Mutuals, the New York Lifes. That's where I started my career. have a lot of respect for those advisors. Um, And I didn't want minimums. Some advisors come to us, they want to continue to sell insurance. They want to do planning. They could do any or all of that. 
Um, what we found though is it's there is a certain sweet spot. I would say 50 million in AUM is probably um, sometimes a little bit less minimum sweet spot. I would say from a revenue standpoint, like 300 or more in revenue is is where this makes sense for people. The advisors we tend to talk to are the between I would say two to 300 million. Um, but we've certainly added and are continuing to add advisors on the other end of that. And the model works just fine for them as well. That's awesome. That's awesome. Cool. And what do you, what are your goals? I'm just curious, like how, how big are you going? Are you going to like go widespread? Or are you just trying to get like X amount of advisors or teams that we, yeah. What, what is it that you really want? Yeah. You know, it's, I'm really critical of the firms that just talk about AUM we have to, to some extent, because that's still the leading marker of, you know, how big a firm is. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, we've always wanted to get to the 10 billion mark intentionally. Um, valuations change at the $10 billion mark. Obviously, firms are valued um, gr greater in a greater way exponentially uh, at that point. Um, but, but more importantly, we want to build a national firm. Um, we're based in New Jersey. We opened an office in San Francisco. That was our first team. Um, opening an office in New York City with an advisor we added. And then opening two offices on the West Coast and one on, I'll say, Middle East Coast in October. So expanding rapidly. Teams that join us get to start the office in whatever location they're at and they get precedent to that area. So I never want to have a firm that's, you know, a bajillion advisors competing against one another. I want to create what I don't think we've really created yet, which is a firm that has a collaborative community feel in the independent world. We have it to some extent, but it's very insular. So if you're an LPL advisor, yes, there's community, but guess what? People are only talking about LPL stuff. Mm -hmm. I think we do a disservice to advisors when we fear them leaving us so much to the point that we don't allow them to really see what's out there. And by the way, there are no restrictive covenants in our contracts. Some people thought uh, I was crazy for that, but if an advisor wants to leave us, they can leave at any time with no restrictions and take every single client with them. Wow, that's pretty cool. Do they keep their brand or is it all now under journey? The only thing we cannot we will draw a hard line on is uh, branding. Got it. Okay. We spent a lot of time helping advise because most of the time, Robin, it's, it's less about the attachment to the name and more about the attachment to how will I say this to clients? Will they look at me different? So we spent a lot of time talking about how to drip that message. I'm evolving. I'm enter entering the next phase of the business life cycle. I've done a lot of reflecting after the pandemic. And so building the story, um, the reason is simple. We can scale resources around marketing easier when we're all under one brand. By the way, everybody has their own voice and look and feel. Uh, um, voice and feel, I'll say, look is the same. And also from a valuation standpoint, obviously, higher valuation on uh, single branded businesses they versus do, different. When they want to sell the business to you, even though they're an employee, they are going to benefit from that higher valuation. Correct. And we set up, this is another unique structure, sub essentially corporations when you join us. So if we do pay out, gets paid out at capital gains rates and not ordinary income tax rates, which a lot of people don't realize. If you monetize, you're gonna get slammed with taxes. Wow, that's awesome. So this is cool. I mean, I know some of you listening, it's, I, I think it's kind of, I think some people are, if they're still listening, like either they're in a place where they're really thinking about this, they're at that 50 to hundred million range, or some might be just listening to like, Oh gosh, I want to get there at some point. But I think like some of the key things to think about, even if you're not thinking about going independent is all these components, what you've done Penny really well. It's like adding things. You, you've already been a consultant for so long. You know how to grow businesses, you know how to help advisors get what they want. And so many advisors are put in this box where they only have so much control. And, and funny enough, like you go W2 and you think like you're losing control, but it feels like I said, more like a partnership when you have much more control of what you want and you let go of what you don't. And regardless of whether you're independent or not, I think that's just a core, core principle to realize like you 
I got into business when I became a financial advisor. I'm not anymore, but when I became a financial advisor, I was like, oh, wow, this is so amazing. One, I get to help people. And two, I get to build the business and life that I want. And, and it wasn't like that for many, many years because it's like you're forced to do like, friend, you know, go to friends and family and do all this like stuff that you don't want to do. And it's kind of like, well, you've got to do that first so that you can get to the lifestyle. And one of the things I tell women a lot, and I know this firm isn't just women, but some, you said, I think your past firm was all women. Was that the case? My consulting firm was all women. I'm proud to say we're majority women um, at our firm. And, but yeah, of course, not, not just women advisors, yeah, yeah, yeah. all cool. advisors. Cool. But just to, to really like, I, we always say, you know, have build your ideal business so you can have your ideal life. And that that's a really important principle for women because we're sacrificing, we're sacrificing. We're like thrown in this man's world to, to kind of act like a man, be like a man. And it's it, not everybody feels that way, but I think that that is a, a general kind of consensus around this industry. And it doesn't have to be that way. Even if you are a, a captive agent, even if you are at, you know, one of the wirehouses, even if you have strict compliances that um, you, one, you can always walk. People are like, oh, but I can't do that. Like, yeah, you, you have legs. You can always walk. <laughs> um, and and two, just like regardless, do your best to build the ideal business that you want so you can have the, the ideal lifestyle because that's so important for women. And that's why most of you got in the industry to begin with because you have this flexibility and freedom to create what you want. And so just to remind you to do that. So this is awesome. So tell them how to find you. Um, and if they're curious about journey and learning more about you guys. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter at Thrivos LLC. If anyone's on Twitter, I'm very active on there. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn, Penny Phillips, uh, journey, strategic wealth. You can look us up on Google. Um, I am very accessible to advisors. I love chatting with them, even if they never want to come to journey. And the one thing I'll leave the audience with is if you're actively going through this exercise now and things are holding you back from making a decision. I always ask advisors to reflect on the belief systems that they need to shed in order to make a powerful decision. So it could be, I'm not a good manager or W2 is bad or high payout is good. Like the belief systems that are ingrained in us that we have to let go of to really make an informed decision. That's a good place to start. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And thank you all for listening. See you next time. I actually have the link for the tag challenge, the appointment generator challenge. So instead you can just go to femalefinancialadvisors.com and register right now so that you can get five quality appointments in just five days. Now, this is not around, you know, you having to talk to friends and family and get all awkward. This is not about you having to spend marketing dollars online or create a whole funnel. This is going to be easy. It's simple. It happens in five days. If I can get you five quality appointments in five days, then you know that you can have the best year of your life because you just need to get in front of more of the right people. We will walk through it together as we do it. So do not miss this. And if you can, if you're smart, do VIP, spend a few extra bucks and you can actually spend time with me on Zoom where I can connect with you, get to know you and really help you get those quality appointments so that you can grow your business. And um, go ahead again, register at femalefinancialadvisors.com. You'll find it all there. It's happening, coming up very, very soon. So make sure to register, claim your spot, get in on this, get excited about it, block your calendar because you need to spend about an hour to an hour and a half uh, a day with me on the Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, so that you can get these results and it does work. The most appointments I think we got in those five days, uh, someone, I think it was Dana, got 33 appointments. So you could be my best student and go well beyond the five quality appointments. Go to 10, go to 15, go to 20 and set your, yourself up for the best year ever. Can't wait to see you at the tag challenge. See you there. Thank you again for listening to Growing Your Financial Business the Woman's Way.